Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, the ZX Spectrum that your dad accidentally left running for 30 years which has since gained sentience. A phrase which was only intended as an intro joke, but that I am now actually tempted to incorporate as some kind of canon component of my avatar's backstory. Regardless, today it is time for the sixth episode of my missed Let's Play as we finally solve this goddamn puzzle. But before we go do that, there's a couple things. First off, I just want to mention that it was Global Make Me Feel Good Day this week, a holiday which I feel is insufficiently recognised, and I would love it if you all went out and made me feel good by sharing my channel with people. Drop me a subscribe, tell people about it. Second thing we need to do is head back to the library and actually have a read of the book for the Channelwood Age, which we missed previously. I promptly forgot that this puzzle involves a time-limited access to the actual linking book, so instead of solving the puzzle, going in there, coming back, and then having to solve the puzzle again, let's just read it now and have done with it. So, this is the first book of the four that you find on the shelves. If you are a native English speaker or most Western languages, you probably read left to right, which means you instinctively look at this book first. It's interesting that the books on the bookshelf are in, in this order of Channelwood, Stoneship, uh, this one, which I think is the Selenitic Age, which is the last one we'll go to, then the code book, and then the Mechanical Age, which is a very different order to the order in which the map of the island on the wall encourages you to go to them. It's instinctive to do them in the order that this map presents, so Mechanical Age, Stoneship Age, Channelwood Age, and then the Selenitic Age up in the, the spaceship. Spoilers for later, I guess. I think that they were expecting people would come to these shelves, read, read the books all the way through in this particular order, and then go do the puzzles, which is in a different order to the books. It's just curious that they made that decision. However, these books themselves are not in complete order, as I believe the Selenitic Age book is the oldest narrative. It's one of Atris's first experiments with this mysterious bookmaking art. Regardless, let's dive into Channelwood. I have called this age Channelwood, and it is a very different world. Though it is exactly how I imagined it, it is still amazing to see it with my own eyes. Water covers this age for as far as I can see, except for a small rocky island. Elsewhere, there are only trees, which grow directly out of the water. A myriad of thin wooden passageways are built just above the water and disappear into the forest. I assume they were built some time ago, for they appear aged. I am eager to discover more about this land and its people, but I have arrived here late and must rest. I was awakened this morning by strange noises coming from a pathway adjacent to the one on which I had slept. I saw a group of monkey-like people heading in my direction. They had not seen me, yet I did not feel threatened by their presence. Their response to me was one that I would never have expected. After staring at me for a short time, they fell to their knees and began what appeared to be some sort of ceremonial worship. I tried to speak to them, but they did not understand my language. Instead, they indicated through enthusiastic hand motions that I was to follow them. As we walked, I began to notice that the waters below us were changing colours. Slowly, subtly, they would change from deep blue to muddy orange, then from muddy orange to beautifully clear. I was so intrigued by the water I hardly noticed we had arrived at a ladder. Climbing the ladder led us to their village, which is about 10 metres above the water and can only be reached by rope ladders that stretch from the lower paths to the village level approximately halfway up the grand trees. It is very interesting watching these people carry out their daily tasks. Even after watching them for hours, I did not understand exactly what they were doing. At sunset, they motioned for me to follow them. I followed the creatures to the doorway of an enormous hut. Strangely, once inside, I found the hut appeared larger than it had from the outside. The walls were garnished with bright metals, and in the centre of the hut sat the leader of these people. At least he appeared to be their leader, for he sat a metre off the floor in a thick throne. Guards surrounded the strong creature, who was dressed in many exotic and colourful fabrics. Next to the leader sat a very old human, at least to some extent he appears human. His hair, which was only on his face and head, was completely grey, almost white, and hung very long around his frail body. His thin head hung limply by an almost grotesque neck that could not hold its head up to look at me. But what a surprise, this creature could speak my language. Shortly thereafter, I was given a bed with some hand motions that looked to be telling me to go to sleep. I look forward to learning more. As I suspected, the ancient creature is a human, but he is old beyond his own reckoning. He seems almost insane. However, the tree dwellers almost revere him as a god. They are treating me now in the same fashion, which makes me feel very uncomfortable. It is almost impossible to understand this old man. His voice is feeble but wild. He has adopted much of the language of the tree dwellers, he himself told me he had not spoken our own tongue in ages. He attempted to explain to me the history of this place, and the following is my best translation of what he has told me. 
Many years ago, the humans and tree dwellers lived together in this place, which was then a vast island. They interacted very little. The humans dwelt on the ground, and the tree dwellers lived high above the humans. Occasionally, the island was disturbed by mysterious rumblings which happened randomly, some sort of tectonic or volcanic action, I suspect. The sometimes slight, sometimes heavy tremors would only last a short time. Then they would stop, allowing everything to return to normal. One day, things changed. The rumbling began, and grew quickly to unprecedented levels. Soon it became apparent that the entire island was sinking slowly into the ocean around them. Many of the humans died that day, but not before sacrificing themselves in order to stop the sinking of the island. The humans who lived through this catastrophe moved into the trees, where they gradually died out, maybe because they were unequipped for such an environment, but I am not sure. This is the story the old man communicated to me, although many details are very unclear in my mind. I am especially confused as to how the humans saved the island from completely sinking. In fact, I doubt the accuracy of that part of the story. The island must have stopped on its own. Yet the old man believes the truth of the story as if he had been there. And the tree dwellers worship him, and apparently all humans, as if he, crossed out in favour of they, were heroes or gods. The old man ended our conversation today with an event which I will never forget. He began gripping my hands tightly, murmuring something about rest and asleep. He then said, we had expected you to come sooner. These actions filled me with a sort of immediate dread. With much effort, he stood to his feet and I tried to help, but he pushed me away with more force than I imagined his frail body contained. The tree dwellers quietly surrounded him with solemn faces. They then kneeled before him. He walked to each and placed his hand on their heads. All the while he murmured words which I did not understand. Finally, he turned to me and smiled. Then he closed his eyes and walked out the door and off the narrow path, high in the trees. The tree dwellers were silent. They began a procession down the nearest rope ladder. As I was descending, I saw several of them pick up the body, he had fallen onto a lower level of the walkway, and carry it away. He was laying down at the dead end of a short pier-like structure. With the use of some potion, one of the tree creatures lit the pier on fire, and I watched as the flames engulfed him. As this strange funeral proceeded, the waters around the pier changed to dull green. This morning I awoke, finding it hard to even believe the previous evening's events. The water is a dull green as far as I can see now. For some reason, the water no longer shifts colour. As I wander throughout the pathways, the creatures watch me, curious to see what I will do next. They are constantly offering me strange objects of affection. I even found food outside the doorway to the room in which I had slept. This is a unique race of beings. I hope to learn their language soon so that I may learn more from them. I have lived on this world for three months off and on, and the tree dwellers have shown great hospitality. I am even beginning to learn bits of their language. I have decided to return home for an extended stay with my loving wife and my sons, and hopefully return with them. However, I am sure Catherine will once again refuse. I think this age would be a wonderful experience for them all, and I at least look forward to how Cirrus and Akinar will react to its curious inhabitants. Catherine is staying behind, as expected. My sons have returned with me, and they enjoy this age very much. They get along very well with the tree dwellers and are picking up their language surprisingly fast. I have no doubt that it will not be too long until they can speak with the tree, tree dwellers much better than I can myself. I am leaving tomorrow to check on the Osmian age. Cirrus has suggested that I allow him and his brother to stay. Although the idea unsettles me, I know that the boys are growing up rapidly. The hospitality of these creatures is such that I can think of no better place to leave them alone for a short while, so I will consent to their request. I warned the boys not to take advantage of the respect the tree dwellers have for their ideas. They seem to understand my warning, and I have faith that they will follow it. Much to my dismay, upon arriving in Eberdunes, I learned that Pran and her people are continuing to be menaced by the Choctic. I fear for their survival and plan on returning to her shortly after checking on Cirrus and Akinar here. See Everdune's journal for more information. After watching Cirrus and Akinar, I see they are handling things very well, and I think I can put to rest any fears about leaving them in Channelwood again. And for a little longer time. The tree dwellers seem slightly distressed that I am leaving, but are happy that Cirrus and Akinar will stay behind again. I've been gone for over three days, and I have been to many different places. I had to tell Cirrus and Akinar about Pran's death today, and they were visibly shaken, although they only remembered her from their childhood. Catherine has suggested it would be wise for Cirrus and Akinar to leave Channelwood for a while, and I have to agree. They will be returning with me when I leave again. I have told my sons that they will be returning with me in two days. They spent the entire night telling me of an adventure they experienced in my absence, and it was rather remarkable. It seems they constructed a boat with the creatures and travelled some ways out into the surrounding waters. I enjoy hearing them talk excitedly of their adventures, and I am reminded of my own adventures as a child. I finally understand why the tree dwellers have been giving me their many inks and insisting that I write with them. Looking through some of my past entries, I see now that the inks have changed from the black I thought they were to various different colours. I have shown some of the creatures my journal and they laughed and howled. I did not know they had such a sense of humour. 
Even now, as I look through this very colourful journal, I cannot help but love myself. We will be returning tomorrow, so my sons are with the creatures for the last night here. They have told me they would like to come to Channelwood again, and also asked if they can visit some other ages alone. Though I, will ha though I will have to think over their request, I believe that they have proven to me they are trustworthy and responsible. Catherine will also have to help me decide whether they are ready for travel alone. For now I must give my farewells to the creatures, for I do not know how long it will be until I visit this age again. And then at the end of the journal we have a map of the village, or at least that's what I assume this is, which I will note down in my own notes. And we have a sketch of one of the tree dweller homes and some kind of windmill diagram. So, doesn't look like there's anything that will be specifically useful for the puzzles that we'll be solving in the Channelwood Age. But we do get a lot of interesting insight into the history of the brothers and their father. Although, I will also point out that um, if it, this is kind of a, an, an unexamined take on a colonialist trope. The idea of meeting quote-unquote primitive peoples who then think you are a god and react in some way. Incidentally, I did look up the solution to this puzzle because I got fed up with it. The solution is that you wait until it makes- until it stops making noises. What it's actually doing is it's pushing a trunk upwards. And once it finishes making noises, we can hurry over there and jump through a hole in the trunk before it's too late. But yeah, so this- this- this trope of- of the uncontacted natives thinking that the traveller is- is- is a god in some way is- very old-fashioned now, and rightly considered to be a relic of colonialist times. And while it is interesting that they try and play with the trope a little bit by making sure that we have Atrus talk about how important it is that the boys don't abuse this power they have over the natives, that doesn't make it not fundamentally an incredibly patronising trope to exist. It's still a patronising idea to have even if you then do weave it into this narrative about how these boys abuse their power. And even then, it's kind of interesting that the trope is still sort of this unexamined thing. This game was written in the 90s, so to some extent it's a product of its time, but... You know, there's excuses and there's excuses. At least it's not... fully indulging in these... In these extremely, like, supremacist colonialist tropes. I find this room kind of interesting because if you look closely you can see that they've painted the walls to look like what I assume Channelwood must look like. But are these the trunks of actual trees from the outside? Do all of the trees in this forest extend underground like this? It's such an odd little detail. Right, let's have a look at the fly-through. So we have a water mill. We have tall trees, we have houses amongst the trees. I'm sure that water mill won't be involved in any kind of complex puzzle. It's probably just there for, uh, you know, milling reasons. There's another interesting aspect to that story, which is that it is um, clearly early enough that he does not have any suspicions about the behaviours of his sons. He still clearly loves and trusts them, a way that he doesn't in the modern day. Which, I mean, is obvious based on the fact that he chose to imprison them in books. Although possibly, maybe the brothers did that to each other, it's not actually clear at this point. This is also by far the most vital of the ages. It sounds locked. All of the other ages we've been to, and Mist itself, are incredibly sterile. We hear in the pages of the books that there are people living in them, and we also, you know, hear about fish and birds, but we never see any of those. There's, there's a seagull in Mist, and that's it. But none of the actual places have anything alive beyond the plants. Whereas here in Channelwood, we can hear this this profusion of life. It sounds like any any swamp you've ever been to in the height of summer. Just 10,000 frogs and insects all yelling, let's fuck, let's fuck. Which is always kind of amusing to me when people like listen to rainforest noise to relax. Like, you know, that's just that's just that's just animals who want a bone, right? Like 
You are listening to the fuck chorus of the rainforest. But even this age doesn't seem to have any people in it. All of the ages that have been mentioned so far have had some kind of... of people involved. Not sure what's up with this. I'm also not sure, like, how to tell when I've made this thing work properly. It looks like it just flicks between two states, maybe? Hmm. It looks like I need to channel power from here, or water, I guess, maybe? Between the different objects. So that's going this way. That's going this way. That's going this way, and that leads to a ruined bridge, which is no help to anyone. But it is, it's also, it's interesting how we hear this story of the boys before they began corrupted, to be corrupted by their power. You have to wonder if this was maybe an origin. Oh! Was that humming previously? Oh, it wasn't. Okay. So I guess I did turn it on somehow with the fiddling I was doing. So that raises this bridge, which gets us to here. Does this go? No, okay, I have to redirect the power, I guess. Oh, we're on the other side of this. Aha! Okay. So that connects here, which means that I can get this lift connected via the pipes now, I guess? If I go back to the other side of the pipes? This, uh, this age is a lot more, lot more of a maze than the others. I can see why they felt the need to include a map. So that's the bridge we made, so that's going this way. And there is not another redirection over here, so... Let's track back to the beginning and see what we can change. What happens if I do this? Does that... Okay, that turns this on, but this is connected to the other side of that, and that's locked, I guess? So that's not helping. But yeah, so, you have to wonder how much of the boys' uh, evilness, I guess, for lack of a better term, is, is natural to who they are as people, and how much of it comes from their upbringing. I've never believed in those kind of like nature versus nurture debates, because obviously it's a combination of both. Like, you have natural predilections and you also have some kind of, um, you know, effect that your upbringing has on you. They're, they're both together, they both matter. I can definitely hear the water trickling, so that's how you can tell where the power is rooting. So it's definitely coming over here and then this isn't doing anything? This one just has some other method working maybe? Oh! Ah, oh, I had to shut the door! <laughs> you wouldn't expect a wooden outhouse looking elevator to have sufficient safety mechanisms as to only work when the door is shut, but it's nice that they felt the, uh, felt the need to include that, I guess. So yeah, do you, do you think that being exposed as a, as a young at a young age might encourage children to grow up thinking that they have the right of life and death over other people? That in itself is a weird question to ask now that I think about it, because even then you're implying some kind of responsibility for how these people ended up, you know? That perhaps the people of these ages created their own oppressors, which is not not really a healthy um, opinion to have, frankly. Is this all just like pots and things? Is there, is there anything else up here? Also, where are the people? Channelwood seems to have been one of the most populous ages based on the book. Aha, okay, look, here's a way down. Can I open that? I don't think so. So happens if I go through here. Nothing, because the power's not supplied, of course. Is there a key to this gate, maybe, I have to find? Am I missing something obvious? I don't know. But yeah, so... Atris seems to have been a good a good dad, who, who raised tried to raise his boys to be respectful, and yet they uh, did not respect any of that stuff, and promptly did a bunch of evil things. Let's try the other elevator and see what happens.
I wonder if the heads we see in some of the other locations are presumably the heads of the eight people from this place. Since they do have a- they don't look human. Oh right, that's locked. Where's the other lift? There was definitely one more. So that takes us over here, and then this way. Takes us to here, and that takes us to here. It takes us around here, but then this is locked off, and then over here is an elevator. So I need to split it there, I think. But yeah, so did the did the conquests these boys planned go to such a vast extent that they wiped out the population of this place entirely? It talks them about it talks about them as being like strong but not necessarily warlike. Perhaps they found themselves encouraged by the boys to take up arms. Perhaps they were the the soldiers led by the boys. Or perhaps not. It's mysterious. The exact sequence of events is kind of a mystery to us. There's that word again. <laughs> so I think that that is everything we're going to talk about today. Let's get to the other end of that lift and then next episode we'll go have another look at what's at the top of this place. Do I have to go all the way around? I think I do. There we go. So this should be working this time. But you know what? Let's just make it... Shit, let's be Santa. Let's find out what's up here. Presumably... Oh, okay. That's just... That's just it? Well, there must be pages here, right? There's definitely some houses that I haven't figured out how to get into. Oh, interesting, and this one won't let me go through. So the only way to go is to go back to Mist? And then come through Mist back to the Channelwood Age to get back around to the other side? That's really interesting. I might have to look up some clues here because I don't know what I missed. And there's presumably every other age we've been to has had a bedroom for each of the boys or some kind of room relevant to each of the boys, which has had the pages in. There must be ones in Channelwood as well. But I really don't know where to go from here. I, I don't know how to figure it out. So I'm going to get a couple of clues and then rejoin you for next episode. Thank you so much for watching. Please make sure to like, subscribe and especially share. And check out my Twitch channel for regular streams. On Twitter you can find announcements and one tweet micro reviews. And if you like what I do and want to support me, you can donate on Patreon or Ko-fi. The links are all in the description and thank you so much for watching.